10 fundraising fundamentals. Fundamentals, what does fundamentals mean? When you think about baseball, for instance, you're thinking about being able to catch a ball, being able to make contact with the bat, knowing how to run to the bases, knowing how to understand what your opponent's trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, that's, that's baseball. There's fundamentals. Mathematics. Do you start with calculus in kindergarten? No. No, no. You start with one plus one. Of course, that's preschool now. It's one plus one and two plus two. My, my four-year-old, one of my granddaughters, um, I have six granddaughters and one grandson, by the way. Uh, one of my granddaughters just turned four, and she was uh, showing me how authoritative she was about the numbers one through ten. <laughs> Don't you love that, those of you who are grandparents? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's go on. Fundraising fundamentals. Thank you. How about this for a thought? Do you believe this? Funding is limitless. Funding is limitless. It's a temptation in our business to think that there's not enough out there for us. But funding is limitless. Who holds resources in this world of ours? 7.6 billion people do. Some pennies, some sums that are just incredible. <coughs> Funding is limitless, but there's a condition to it. Funding is limitless for those who go out and get it. Funding is limitless for those who go out and get it. There's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. And not that there isn't a windfall from season to season, but we've had very few of those over my 10 years at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. We've had our success because we went to get it. And I tell you what, if we had more fundraisers, we would have gotten a lot more these last 10 years. We had to live within our human constraints, our human constraints. But the ability to raise funds and the resources that are available to Lincoln University are limitless if you pursue them. If you don't pursue them, it's limited because you're not pursuing them. If you pursue them, the opportunities are unceasing. Number two, let's go. I should say this before we go on to number two, back to number, you know, I, you know, all seasons are good seasons. Years ago, I worked as the development uh, director for 10 years with the Catholic Diocese of Belleville. I'm a Roman Catholic, um, like probably many of you, very serious about my spirituality. And worked for a magnificent leader, his name's Wilton Gregory. He went on from being uh, a bishop in the Diocese of Belleville to being the Archbishop uh, of Atlanta, Georgia. And he's been there for many years. He's just, you know, one of the most incredible people I've had the privilege to associate with, Wilton Gregory. And he, he came in uh, a couple of years before I arrived, and there was a disaster on their hands. Uh, unfortunately, there had been uh, uh, misconduct on the part of some of the clergy, and uh, too many, way too many. And the, there was great turmoil, and he came in, and by his incredible pastoral leadership, was able to bring peace and move some of those situations along to the right kind of conclusion. So after a year or so, they advertised for a director of development. And I saw it and I thought, hmm, that interests me. I, got, I learned more and I thought this. I thought, well, if I go in and fail, who can hold it against me? On the other hand, what a great opportunity to go in and rock and roll. So I did the latter, spent 10 years there. We raised 80 million dollars in Southern Illinois, those of you who know Southern Illinois, not a whole lot of money in Southern Illinois, but we raised 80 million dollars over those 10 years. And we did it in rare, rare uh, in rough waters. We had the first campaign in, at, at that time, the 110 year history of that institution. And we called it a future full of hope. From a pa passage in Jeremiah, those of you who know that phrase, a future full of hope. Because what we used the campaign for was to reset the future of the diocese and the services that that organization would provide to its membership uh, throughout Southern Illinois. Uh, I mentioned coming into the Great, great uh, Recession. 
Now, we had a choice uh, when the Great Recession hit. A number of institutions around the country, universities and nonprofits, were suspending campaigns or they were holding off on campaigns because this terrific loss of uh, value in the marketplace that hurt so many people who were in the market. And I was wrestling with it because, of course, I wasn't hired to advise the chancellor, let's stop the campaign, nor did I want to because I'm way too ambitious. And I remember reading an article as I was thinking about this, and this writer, very wise, he said there were some organizations that raised more money in the Great Depression than they did before. And I decided, we're going to be one of those. Let's go. So we had a great outcome. We blew people out. You know, we raised 54% more my first year than the prior year, which was the, the best year up to that year. 54% more when we announced that. That's another one of those announcements that swept through the community. The chancellor and I were interviewed by various national publications. Because how could they do that? How could they do that with this terrible recession that we're in the throes of with no end in sight? So all seasons are good seasons and funding is limitless. Next, thank you. Sounds obvious. How do you raise more money? You have to make it a priority. Now, those of you who are actively engaged in, in business or other things that are of meaning to you, it's always you have to make what you care about most the priority, an overwhelming priority among your many competing priorities. I said it's a face-to-face -face work to begin the last talk, and we have to dedicate time to it. We have to be focused on time. There's always distractions. Now, I know a poor fundraiser when I see him just as well as I know a good fundraiser when I see her. I've had enough you know, years in the saddle. I can spot them really quickly. And sometimes you know, we don't make the best hires at our university. Sometimes we take a chance on somebody. And I tell you what, you know who I know is a poor fundraiser? Their distractions are their focus. We don't hire them to do events. We don't hire them to uh, get distracted by academic departments. We hire them to raise money on behalf of those academic departments in the university. And if they can't manage their time such that their fun the reason we hired them, the reason we hired them, we, we, would, we would let those folks go. On the other hand, you know, the majority of our fundraisers have been just the opposite. They understand, they get serious, they get busy, and they work with absolute utmost dedication, and that accounts for so much of our success. Invest resources. So I, I alluded to this the first talk. When Chancellor George first arrived and assessed the university, they set a strategic plan in place, and that was to have the first campaign of the university. At that time, let's see, that would have been maybe Oh gosh, uh, the university might have been 46 years old, something like that. A good time to start a campaign once, once a university gets into the 40s. We're 55, we're in our 55th year, by the way. What year is it for this, Lincoln? 152. Ah, man, I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. We have to invest resources, and what are um, our faculty senate did was the chancellor approached them and they agreed to reallocate a million dollars a million dollars to fundraising and for the creation of the campaign so that was you know that's a lot of money and but they you know and you know they they couldn't have all the you know the professors they wanted as a part of that i mean it was it was a material sacrifice for the stakeholders to make that decision, but they did. Now, I might, I might also add, we lost that million dollars over the last 10 years of funding uh, through budget cuts. But uh, it helped launch us. And so the institution has to figure out how much money it can devote to fundraising. And then the, the, you have to get to it and do it, and you have to, what I call, patience, you have to have patience and perseverance. When I was a child, I was a child once, not as tall as this, you know, I was an active boy, and my mother used to say to me, Martin, 
Pray for patience and perseverance. How do you think I reacted? Impatiently. <laughs> what? No, Martin, pray for patience and perseverance. And, that, that, you know, I think about that here, you know, uh, I'm 63, so, you know, nearly 60 years later, and how true that is. This is all about building a program and staying the course. Back to the long view concept, we have to stay the course. And then we have to plan and execute. That goes back to the slide we looked at on metrics, on things to focus on. And we can focus on additional metrics too, but uh, I, I mentioned the basics. Make fundraising a priority. Next slide, please. Well, this, this gets back to a comment uh, made uh, earlier. Uh, give than ask. I'll never take a volunteer on, the, on a call that hasn't given first. Because what would be ruinous to that call is when the fellow or the, the woman or the couple asks the volunteer, well, how much have you given? Right. Oh, you know, I'm going to get to it. Oh, yeah. You think that ruins a, a call? And I'll only take people that have made commitments of what I call uh, greater significance. In other words, it doesn't have to be a million dollars, but it has to be proportionate. It has to be proportionate. It has to be the best they can do, given their resources and the, the time in which they live, the, the season of the life that they're in. As long as they do that, so they can say, I gave this much with their head held high and proudly, because they bought in as much as they could. It's a very, very compelling, very compelling volunteer. I think we have a room here of supporters. If you're not giving, you must start giving now. You must. And for those of you who are, who are giving at a level of greater significance, thank you for doing so. For those of you who aren't, as the president begins lining things up and charting the course and calling upon you for assistance, give as much as you can. Give as much as you can. You will not be disappointed. You will have that extraordinary experience, as I mentioned earlier, that it's better to give than receive. It's better to give than receive. Volunteers, as I've mentioned, you, you can't do it without volunteers. Now, we don't always have volunteers ask for money. Like I said, we have, enough, we have uh, a goodly amount of staff. We'll have the sta our staff are very, are very trained in all of this. But volunteers can help set the stage and on occasion be the one to ask for money. By the way, with Chancellor George, he's been a chancellor for 22 years across two institutions, I almost always ask for the money with the chancellor. And uh, there's reasons for that. One is he is such a phenomenal communicator, storyteller. But we're engaging with people the first time oftentimes or second time. We ask ambitiously. Some people are, that, that disturbs them. He doesn't want to be said no to. And so I get to hear the no's. We'll get the no's in a minute. I usually make the solicitation. He has his role. They want to see him. They don't really want to see me. They don't care about me. But I insert myself, nevertheless, to do the job that needs to be done and, and ultimately the purpose for our call. And then a culture of philanthropy. What does that mean? That means creating among your alumni passion, engagement, and financial support for the university. But it also includes your faculty and staff. So we have on our campus what we call the Inspire campaign. In fact, Kyle, who's in the back, uh, videotaping this for me. Um, and don't let me forget to say something about videotapes. Uh, but Kyle, who's in the back, is responsible for coordinating that. And it has been terrific because what we want our faculty and staff to do, many of whom have gotten pittance of raises over the years, is to recognize what it is about their work that's inspirational. What is it that they look around about the university and they're most proud of? And then we ask them, can you do a few dollars? Can you do much, much more? But everyone give and do what you can. And we've dramatically increased our uh, faculty and staff support and that creates, that creates a culture that the university is important. Yeah, I wish I had more money, but what I'm doing matters. And what I'm doing, I'm doing it with an institution whose mission I love and inspires me. Next slide, please.
we touched on this, every donor, every contribution counts. Every donor, every contribution counts. You want to hear an interesting story to illustrate that? A guy named Charlie, Charlie Huffman, I don't think he'd mind my saying. In fact, he'd be glad I'm saying it. Charlie Huffman. He had a remarkable career in the telecommunications industry. During the course of that career, he got a, a call from a student once and he took it, sent in a hundred bucks. Anyway, after this, August, uh, being a CEO of a number of major telecommunications companies, including the largest one in uh, Canada, they retired back to St. Louis. And he kind of wanted to, was curious about the university, and he sent in a check, unsolicited check for $1,000. Well, you know, uh, somebody got the thousand bucks who was raising money for the business school and said, hey, a thousand bucks. They began to do research and say, oh my God, this is the Charlie Huffman. We were in a campaign, we were raising money for phase one of our business school. He was passionate about the business school. We were working to build a relationship and when we finally asked, we asked at a number of gift range, uh, several gift price points, you might say, and the lowest one was a million dollars. In fact, my staff came to me and they had suggestions for less than a million dollars. And I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. There's nothing less than a million dollars. We know the capacity of this fellow and his wife. And we also know that he's been warming up significantly and enjoying his connection to the university. We got the million dollars. He's given subsequently. But most, perhaps the most outstanding feature of this is he's a businessman. He's got a bachelor's and master's degrees in business from our university. And he threw his hat in the ring to be the next uh, College of Business Administration dean. Now the competition was 12 other, it was 12 PhDs. And we chose Charlie. And I tell you what, Charlie has done a remarkable job with our College of Business Administration. Remarkable. But if he hadn't given the hundred dollars, you think he would have come to our attention? If he hadn't given the thousand dollars, you think we would have began spending interpersonal time with him? And you think about the magnitude of a thousand to a million. That's what we got by going through that process I described earlier, that developing donors cycle. So every donor, now in, in our business, what we know is this, those who give 25 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks a year, because that's what they can do, and they do it for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we're going to benefit from, in addition to that money over all those years, typically a planned gift, typically a deferred gift. They put the organization in their estate. And they do that by giving the best they can along the way, which may not, you know, again, bring them to the top that we, or where we want to focus upon folks with our human, our limited uh, time and energy as, uh, as personnel and so on. But, but, you can't underestimate those gifts, and we have to pay attention to them, properly thank them, properly thank them, uh, keep, keep them informed about why the university matters and how their contribution is helping the university, being grateful. It's all about gratitude, isn't it? Life's all about gratitude, I think. Okay, next slide. It's all about the donors. I think we've heard that this morning. They have needs. They have aspirations. They have need to be respected. They have aspirations for our universities. And when we engage with donors, of course, we bring our priorities to them, but we have to be open to what the donor wants to accomplish. Now, it's rare in my uh, 25, um, almost 25 years of fundraising where we haven't been able to integrate a great idea from a donor in the, in the institutions I've worked for. Very, very rare. And how you treat that uh, is something you have to be artful about. But they bring ideas that can be transformational for our organizations. And we have to be open to what the donor cares about most. Time belongs to the donor. Guess what else belongs to the donor? Money, resources, resources. So what they have to say about the resources, don't you think that matters a great deal? Yeah. And I've, I've hit on this, gifts of greater significance. 
That's we, how we want to uh, engage with donors and the five P's, uh, proper preparation prevents poor performance. Some people add a sixth P to that. Proper performance or preparation prevents poor performance. We prepare for every call we go on. We have a sheet that we fill out uh, that, that helps us lock in to what we're all about. And then if we're bringing a volunteer, I'm bringing the chancellor. Before we're going, I'm re I've rehearsed and reviewed exactly who the folks were, are that we're going to go see and uh, what it is we want to do and how uh, we'd like to, I would like the call to be directed. Now the chancellor's the chancellor. He won't always do it as I ask. But we, he, he's, we work in harmony ultimately to have that successful call. Another thing I'll do, by the way, is um, in preparing a call, I usually ask one of my staff to come in. And I'll say, well, what do you think, this is training, by the way. I'll ask them, what do you think about this? this? This is what I've got in mind. Or, help me. I don't know what we're going to do on this call. I couldn't believe I got the call. What do I do? And I get input from my staff member. We'll go and execute the call. And I can say many of our calls have been flawless, but not all of the calls. So I'll come back and I'll sit down with that staff member or two. And I'll say, this is how it went. And if I missed an opportunity as I reflected, if I wasn't listening, thinking about what I was going to say next, and missed a nuance in what the donor said that had I been paying attention, I would have picked up on, and it would have taken us in a, perhaps a better direction, I'll tell my staff that. Why do I do that? I do that to train my staff. I do it to train myself. I do it because I want them to grow and learn that they ought to be transparent in how they conduct their activities and draw upon their fellow fundraisers to prepare their calls so that they got their, they're as well prepared as they possibly can be. So I, I, I give that thought to you. On to the next slide. Now those of you who are might think about going on a call. This was mentioned earlier. Knows. It's, it, scares, it scares volunteers. In fact, it scares those poorer fundraisers. But knows are nothing to worry about. Remember the long view? One no doesn't mean they're going to say no, <coughs> no forever to the next time and the next time and the next time. You keep swinging. There's one donor who's very generous to our, our university, and I mean very generous to our university. He just in the past year gave us a half a million dollars for our jazz program. I mean that's a lot of money. His total giving is over two million dollars. I love this man and I love his wife so very much. Uh, solid business uh, man. And I went in one day with this big proposal. Big proposal. And he said, well I need to talk to you know, Mary uh, and I said, how about if I come back in two weeks? Yeah, that's a good time to come back. I come back and he said, well, Martin, we just can't consider that proposal right now. And he went on to say, but please come back. Uh, when you have your next idea, I'd love to hear about it. So he said no, but he didn't say no. That $500,000 jazz, I could have turned away and said, well, we're all done with John and Mary because he just said no to me. What no's do is no's are a part of the engagement with people. Those of you in sales and business, you know, you, you get this. It's what we do with the no's. We build upon a no. We build upon the no. It's better to know that's the no, and what I'll always do is I'll say very politely, well, well why? Could you, is there, you could, could you help me understand? Now, do you like saying no to somebody? Most people don't. You'd rather not say no, you'd rather say yes. When they say no and I ask, well, would you help me understand why is this? Uh, then the spreadsheet comes out. Then the disclosure comes out. Then some information about their circumstances that are intimate to them that they, we might not otherwise know is revealed. We understand them better. And also, sometimes they realize, oh my God, I just said that to him. I hope he's trustworthy, and when we prove ourselves trustworthy of such sacred information, 
that bond deepens and they want to help us as soon as they can next round next time around or maybe the time after that we need to uh, not worry about no's see them as part of the relationship that we enjoy on to the next slide please you ever wonder this who do you ask well one way we ask everyone don't we <laughs> but when it comes to major gifts where we only have so much time uh, so much energy so much people power to be invested in, uh, in, uh, in, in donors and in prospects to position the institution for a solicitation. You have to focus, you have to winnow that group down. You have to narrow that group down. And you do that essentially by focusing on affinity and capacity. Next slide, please. So by capacity, we're talking about financial wherewithal. Financial wherewithal. And you might know this by public records, you might know this by uh, a volunteer who knows, has some insight into a particular um, uh, family or so on. Uh, a business, you know, you can read about the charitable giving that they're making and, you know, think about, well, what, what, what are their charitable giving priorities? Do we have something that we could go to them that aligns with their priorities? And so an affinity is that attachment to the institution. Is it low or high? Now we want to bring everybody who has low affinity up as high as we can. And we do that as best we can through opportunities like galas and golf, golf outings and uh, information, you know, periodicals and solicitations that we send to people. But we want to look for those in that upper right hand quadrant that have the highest affinity and highest capacity. Now how do you get this? You do need staff for this. You need, you need professionals to join you and to do this work. It takes time and energy to identify where your greatest uh, donors are, or greatest potential donors are. And then this is how the president gets directed ultimately. Certainly her time, you want the, the president focusing one-on-one -on -one with that group in that square. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. Next slide, please. I referenced this earlier. We need to ask for a specific amount ask for a specific amount. If you ask, please do what you can to help us, you know what you're gonna get? You're not gonna get a gift of greater significance. You're gonna get something far, far less. So you go through the exercise to examine who they are, think about their capacity and their affinity, and then you bring a gift that of course you don't want it to under it, undershoot if you can, nor do you wanna overshoot. You wanna hit the target, and hopefully get a very positive outcome. But there's risks. There's risks of overshooting. How could one overshoot, you might ask? And of course, there's risks of undershooting. If they say too readily, I can do that $10,000, <laughs> you might think, dang, I should have <laughs> asked for 20. <laughs> time for a story? I gotta be respectful of your time. There's a woman, <clears throat> no longer in St. Louis, and I can't name the company, but she worked in a very prestigious Fortune 500 company. And it was a very um, male-dominated industry. So I was up seeing her one day, and out in the lobby, the spectacular lobby, were the latest company uh, magazines. And on this magazine, there was uh, this group of tw about 20 men, all you know, dressed to the nines, about 20 men, half of them were Caucasian, not an African-American in the group, I'm, I, I'm afraid to say with this organization, and half of them would appear to be Chinese. So the company was striking a bargain, had struck a bargain with a, uh, I'm sure, a major Chinese entity. Well then in front of those 20 men, dressed to the nines, right in the middle, sitting on a chair, was this woman that I was going to be visiting. That says a lot. You think about how that woman is, is the composition of that lady. She's got to be something else, something really special, which she was. We had gone previously and asked for a million dollars. We used a volunteer who actually served on the board of the company that she worked for, the chancellor and me. We had a great call. 
And when I returned, and I noticed this on this magazine, I uh, was excited because the next day I was going on vacation. And I thought, this is going to be a great send-off. Okay, maybe she won't do a million, but 500 probably, 250 for sure. And I went into the meeting. Amazing. So she's got this, of course, fantastic office. A uh, large conference table, a circle, and this big uh, uh, U-shaped, you know, working space she would use. And she comes and has, invites me to sit at a chair. She sits across from me. And then she says, I've never been so angry in my life that you would ask such an unrealistic sum of money from me. What would you do? I thought to myself, holy. <laughs> and then I thought, well, here we go. And I began by apologizing. I began by explaining that we don't know you well enough yet. Uh, we did, which we did. We, we're new at this. We have to go out and raise money for the university. And you know, by the way, we know how much money you make uh, yearly because it's public record and uh, put in the St. Louis Business Journal, she says. I wish they wouldn't do that. <laughs> and I said, the last thing we would want to do, I, and I also said, many, many people in your station in life actually would expect us to ask for a million dollars. But obviously, you feel differently, and I'm so sorry. Well, what happened was, as I was doing this, I began to notice they were welling up. She got up from the table, she went over to her U-shaped desk, she had a set of Kleenex, she grabbed the Kleenex, she starts going like this, she comes back and she says, I've never ever cried in the workplace before. I thought to myself, you are now. <laughs> anyway, what I found out was, what I found out was, she wanted to do it. But we had never engaged her husband. We had zero relationship with her husband. And they're both very, he's very successful too. Both retired now, but very successful. We had never engaged with him. So he didn't want to do it. And it created during this time period, this consternation, this upset, this unhappiness, this frustration with, in a way, Amsel for creating this mess that she and he were now experiencing. Well, I reassured her, and she revealed that to me. She revealed that to me. Remember, knows sometimes. Knows sometimes. And I reassured her, you know, Mary will never think less of you. We hold you and John in absolutely the highest uh, respect. That is undiminished whether you were to give us a million dollars or zero dollars, our affection and respect for you is, is you know, absolutely unchanged. Well, long story short, we got a check for $100,000, one-tenth of what we asked for. Twice after that, she made the comment to me, one day, one day. And guess what else we did? We invited her husband, John, to serve on one of our advisory boards to try and plug him in and get him engaged. So we haven't gotten the million yet. I think we will. That'll happen after I'm gone. I've done my work. I don't own the relationships. I'm a steward for a while I'm at the university, and that's all. Hey, you know what? We don't, we don't hit the bullseye. In fact, we don't hit the bullseye near enough, but we have to be about the act of shooting the arrows if we ever hope to hit a target. Okay, we're almost done. Closed gifts. I'm working with a donor right now. I'm working with a donor right now. This is a gift that's 15 years in the making. 15 years. In the first two months, the chancellor was at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. He received what he felt was like a random invitation to a wedding from uh, this couple. And the gentleman ran uh, a growing company in the community. And uh, 
as the chancellor described it to me, this, this individual was absolutely surprised that the chancellor actually came and made a big deal about it. Well, as, as they've interacted over 15 years, they've become very friendly because they share a common passion, academic passion, if you will. And they engage and engage with others around this shared passion. We met with this donor about six years ago. And the donor said, give me a proposal. I mean, I want your best proposal. If I had people working hours and hours on this proposal, $5.3 million, I was so pumped because he said he wanted the proposal and he said he wanted it all. We asked for it and he said, hmm, let's find a way to get your students more involved with our company. <laughs> They did give a, a previously $100,000. Now, what they're talking about is an $8.1 million commitment. They've gone from $100,000 to $8.1. And I was at a meeting again with the donor, uh, the chancellor and I, and uh, another individual in which he said, and we've already talked about the timeline, we fully, we fully desire to do it by June 30th. <coughs> but guess what? It's not documented yet. We can't, we're, e asking becomes the easiest part of this. Closing oftentimes becomes the most difficult. And oftentimes the people with the greater resources are incredibly busy. I mean, this gentleman tra traverses the globe for business reasons. And you think we're the only uh, folks asking for his support? I mean, he's got a, a line a mile long. But we've risen to the top because of 15 years of engagement. And has his, as his business has prospered, he and his family has, have prospered, now we are going to prosper if they sign a document. <laughs> Finally. It's a roller coaster ride. Doing this work full time, I'll tell you what, there's great highs and there's some lows. And there's, there's swirls, drops, turns that are unexpected, some of which just upset my stomach greatly, make me want to throw up. I'm so disappointed and crushed. On the other hand, some of these highs, I remember during our campaign, we were in the last month of that seven year campaign. And a donor decided uh, uh, to give us $2.2 million. Well, we had two price points, 1.1 and 2.2 for our request. I was floored that they were actually going to do the whole thing. I was floored. I just expected they were going to do the 1.1, but they did the 2.2. I was floored and so en encouraged by that. We have to have the Constitution to get on, uh, to get on the ride and to stay on it to the end. And we do that as volunteers, and we do that as, as staff, we do that as the university president. We do it together, but we have to expect that there's ups and downs, just like there is in life. In the fundraising world, there's ups and downs.